Uh, good morning, good afternoon to you, uh, Professor Barry here. This is the week we move into culture. Oh, yeah, culture, language, groups, think about social socialization, all from the sociological perspective. I, I brought some, some props here today, kind of talk about hats a little bit. Um, yeah, let's get started. We're just going to kind of jump in. You know, we uh, the first couple of weeks lay a foundation, kind of what is sociology, sociological theory. So you kind of got that part hammered in or hammered down. And um, yeah, it takes a while to kind of get your head wrapped around theory. We talk about them in class. Um, you know, you kind of, the, the textbook walks through applications of theory um, in every chapter starting, really starting in chapter of deviance and forward. It's an application of all three theories to different, um, to different areas. So you'll get more and more familiar with the theories as we kind of move forward. Okay, so let me just show this map first. We can kind of talk about this and then kind of kind of get into defining, explaining culture and then start to pull it apart, kind of identify some different aspects of culture and kind of examine this. This is it. It's called the cultural value map or the world cultural map. And uh, it's been a survey that's been going on. This is dated 2005 to 2020. They've been doing, um, Hofstede, I think was the, maybe the original researcher of doing how cultural values vary across nations and mapping it out. So this is just kind of, a, I don't know, it's a good starting point, sort of thinking about these, these clusters um, of cultural values around the world and maybe what things, have, what has shaped those values in those different places. So for example, you look here at the bottom, you have a scale of survival versus self-expression. So let's say just strong individuality, individual freedom, individual voice, like that, those values of self-expression versus being in a, in a place in a, in a community where you're more focused on meeting everyday life needs, survival. You can almost imagine that this is, to be in this kind of an environment, you're gonna to have to rely on the social group in a fundamentally different way than in a culture that has a strong focus on self-expression. Then over here, you move to traditional values um, compared to secular science, a move away from religion. Um, and we have sort of a difference going on there. There's a lot of things we could talk about here, but one thing I kind of, kind of point out is, first of all, we have sort of a religious kind of difference going on here like between European countries, Catholic Europe versus Protestant Europe. Um, if you ever heard the term WASP in the United States, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, those are like the business leaders in early America, I mean, industrial age America. Um, so there's something about the Protestant faith that um, links up to economic development. And this becomes a theory or idea from Max Weber that we'll get into later on, uh, that cultural values shape economic realities. Um, so that's one thing I kind of just want to kind of indicate here is that these sort of values that are coming through from an institution of religion, maybe shaping in some sort of way the values uh, within society outside of religion, including economic values, you know, the, the economic structure issues, as well as the view of the individual. Um, the other thing to indicate here too is where it's the uh, find the United States, which is United Kingdom, here's the USA, is if you look at certain things, sometimes people talk about like the Nordic countries and being really progressive and these kind of things. Um, and, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Well, notice that they're much more secular in terms of values. And I don't know if you know what strong conclusions we can draw from that, but I think sometimes in the United States, what we struggle with is we have, there's skepticism of science and then there's, then there's, kind of like a, um, a reaction to science. So there's like a, a healthy skepticism that we should always be kind of evaluating and not, you know, and, and just being a good uh, critical reviewer of information. Um, but we tend to hold on to traditional values and struggle with this transition to a more secular um, kind of ways of life. Uh, this, so those are just two things I want to indicate here. Just, just really just kind of like to look at while well, there's, all these, you know, we have all these nations around the world. There are some, you can kind of map things out and look for some commonalities across nations in place and then start to look, you know, that general in the particular, look for those patterns and things that might be influencing um, communities. 
Well, let's define like well, what is culture? Language, you know, it's the language that we speak encoded within language. And we'll get into this a little bit later. Encoded within language are values and beliefs themselves. Language shapes the way that we view the world. Um, so culture is, a, you know, is you could define culture as a, is a part, part of culture is language, it's beliefs, it's the values of a, you know, of a society, what society deems is right and wrong, traditions, rituals, practices, stories that we tell, the narratives, the myths of a, of a community, that's all part of culture. Culture is learned. Um, David Foster Wallace, his graduation speech, uh, you can YouTube it, uh, really interesting speech. And um, yeah, he talks about, basically starts off the speech that we swim in water, right? That's these fish, you know, swimming in water and then one turns to the other and says something about, it, you know, you're in water. And it's like, they don't realize that they are, they're immersed in culture. They're just around us, right? We just take it for granted. It's just part of our life experience. Um, and, you know, here, they, there are these two young fish swimming, and they happen to meet the older fish swimming the other way who wrote not stem morning boys how's the water and the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over the other and says you know what the hell is water i don't even realize they're swimming in this kind of stuff and we can kind of really kind of go there it's, you know it's, it's it's so familiar that it's invisible to us to some degree to get a culture you have to think about the marker you know to get a culture one thing we can do we think about the markers of a successful life and, you know, like, what is it? Is it, is it an ownership of a particular car? Is it a particular occupation? I mean, those are going to reflect culture. I mean, clearly, if you go to different places around the world, there may be some, some in developed countries may have some of these similar markers, but they're very much reflective of culture in place. Uh, from the moment that we wake up, we're immersed in culture. Um, and, you know, you know, it's just, we are immersed in culture from the moment we wake up till, till we put our bed, head down at night, we are immersed within culture. I can't share videos um, on these PowerPoint or on these video lectures because YouTube will flag it and more or less it's like for copyright reasons. But if you're interested, this is kind of an interesting, fun little video. I mean, you can open up the PowerPoint and then go to this video. Um, the, the sounds, you know, like, you know, making a dog sound, woof, woof, rough. I mean, these little things and how, how different cultures, different people in different cultures make animal sounds. It's like, you know, set, there's variability within that. It's, it's fun, it's entertaining. And then slurping, slurping, eating ramen. This guy's kind of walked through like how to slurp eating ramen. I mean, that's cultural practice, right? I mean, it's something that we're in the, in the United States largely taught that, you know, to be quiet when we're, when we're eating food, uh, if we're having soup, definitely not to slurp eating soup. I mean, it's such a cultural kind of thing. Cultural practices are fun. Kind of look at, be able to examine all those different things that are going on from culture. So here's, you know, from the moment we wake up in the day, right? You got, you know, coffee, that's, you know, cultural practice. What kind of coffee? You kind of go, go there, go, okay, is it a French press? Is it, a, you know, a curry, you know, the one, the little pods. I mean, that's like, you know, new technology. Um, I mean, um, espresso, where we go for coffee, uh, how do we enjoy our coffee? What kind of coffee? Those are all markers of culture in some sort of way. Um, I put a rock star there, you know, not everyone drinks coffee. I think um, meditation are practices that we engage in in the morning. Um, how do we start the day? It's learned, like, again, you know, as we're immersed in culture, we don't realize that some of this stuff may be very unique to our time and place at our own social location. Having the ability to have a shower, how we, you know, our, our, our bathing routines, um, Bathrooms are fascinating. I think in a lot of ways, or just even the process of defecation or urination, uh, it's, it's a learned phenomena. It's a cultural phenomena. There's variability ar around the world. Ideas about privacy, ideas of, uh, ideas about the, about the body, um, the architecture, design of buildings, technology that you know is all part of this sort of experience of going to the bathroom. I put this here. Like here's a bunch of uh, products for bathing products for women. And there's sort of dub for men. So, you know, it's like, huh, it's kind of interesting that, I mean, it's just, you know, it's soap and shampoo, but you go down to the aisle in a supermarket, it's like the, plethora, the proliferation of, of, of options. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a reflection of our mass commodity world, uh, a lot of variability, you know, kind of reflecting culture stuff. This is a bidet. So, you know, shoots water up after you go to bed number two, shoots water up. Um, 
actually used one one time. It's kind of pretty interesting experience. Uh, it's definitely a, a cultural thing. Um, toilet paper. Yeah. So anyway, we're immersed in it, right? Um, spam had its sort of heyday after World War II. Uh, it was kind of like more common element to have in the home in the United States. Um, spiced ham. Uh, it's not something that we see very often now. So things change across the culture and time. The Black Power Movement, uh, the Black Panthers in the 1960s. I mean, that symbol in terms of Black Power, very strong marker of culture. This idea of, you know, of um, a folk way, a practice within society itself. So this sort of practice of holding the door open for uh, this girl, you know, learning this you know, socialization, learning culture, um, and those change across time as well. Things like, you know, markers, our physical self, um, sort of this idea of sort of, of whiteness and sort of the, the status that, that we give, the social construction of reality, the what we assign meaning to is really arbitrary. And, you know, globalization has an impact in terms of some of these kind of things as well. And then you kind of go to the, you know, this, this is a fun um, short little video TED talk on jump rope and, the, and, and rhythm um, and sort of what it's, it's really informative, interesting, engaging. And she also mentions that the way that girls were in the, in the inner, inner city were jump rope and engaging in jump rope that is the precursor to hip hop and rhythm. They're pretty cool. It's like an interesting connection. All right, so it's kind of like now kind of distinguished between material culture and non-material culture. All right. Yeah, so material culture are basically objects, right? It's the artifacts, um, artifacts, the artifacts that are around us and they tell a story. Um, this is G.I. Joe, the 1960s, 1970s, then G.I. Joe starting, starting in the 1980s became what we call hypermasculine. And this is true of a lot of action figures, even that language, right? Action figures versus dolls. It kind of gets into a little bit of a like language and culture stuff, but a big shift in terms of representation of the male body of action heroes. Think about the Incredible Hulk, uh, which was a TV show back in the 1970s based on uh, like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of thing where he got really mad and then he'd turn into this as Bill Bixby was the actor. And then he'd turn into this green monster. And it, uh, that was played by Lou Ferrigno, who was an actual body, bodybuilder. And now you look at, you know, representations of Incredible Hulk now, it's this massive kind of thing. Well, it's something going on in culture. So, you know, it's like you can, we can look at culture and changes in culture and start to ask questions about where does that come from and why and what, how does that express culture? Uh, how does it inform us about culture? And we can study the material culture to get at some of that stuff. This you probably have never seen, but I remember, oh, I don't know what, it's probably before, it's probably like the 1970s, 80s. This is a bathroom and it's so hard to imagine now. I always thought it was kind of disgusting. Um, but this is how you dry your hands uh, before they had those, you know, air dryers and things like this. This is a towel and you'd wash, you know, dry your hand and then you pull, you know, you pull down a little bit further. Uh, and it's not like you get anything new. This thing is recycling. It's just kind of moving through it, And I, it's just the most bizarre thing. It's just kind of people having, you know, drying your hands off, pull down, you go up there and you pull down to get to the next. Um, but, you know, you had a hundred people go through there. I think it's just moving, going through it's same people drying their hands in the same thing or different people drying their hands in the same thing. Um, fallout shelters, 1950s, World War II, 1940s, 1950s, fear of, fear of, um, you know, of, of being bombed by, by, by Germans, by, by Russians. Americans were building fallout shelters in their backyard. Um, it's pretty crazy to think about that um, today. Uh, Nike Jordans, Converse, shoes, fashion, clothes. The bottom right, when men were in the Western Europe were wearing wigs uh, and the sort of really wigs and it was, the, it was a status, a symbol of status. Um, and then, you, you know, even things like the practical, like a beer cans, uh, looking at it, sort of the, the tops of beer cans before they developed. This is, you know, the old way, uh, just using a can opener and then, you know, slowly developed all these different, different ways of doing things until to get to what we have today. Part of the material culture, you can start, start getting into um, 
how we both a cultural practice and then the material culture. So value that we place. Um, a status we place on certain ideas about our our body. Straight white teeth is just a really fascinating, interesting kind of thing going on in terms of um, the value that we place on straight white teeth. It's kind of a sign of moral um, self. And it also, you know, it could have an influence on economic opportunity, um, how other views, other people view oneself. Um, and how one views oneself. I mean, it can have a really powerful impact in terms of kind of self-concept and self-definition. Um, first impressions are everything. New study confirms people with straight white teeth are perceived as more successful, smarter, having more dates. Um, but there's something going on there in terms of perception, which is kind of odd, right? The meaning that we assign to something that is, is a marker of what we believe somebody is. And that you're in this culture, right? And if culture assigns that kind of meaning where you are in this position, like self-determination, right? That we, you have to kind of navigate that space of understanding those cultural ideals and whether you meet or don't meet those and the pressures to conform, not conform, the realities in terms of having resources to conform or not conform. I mean, there's just like, you know, you're swimming in this kind of stuff. It started like, I don't know, maybe, um, 15 years ago, something like that, these, you know, white, white strips for one's teeth. And it's interesting, at least when I come type in white strips teeth, um, I mean, curious if you were to do that as well, when I type it in and I do a Google search or I do a search in the search engine, that what pops up is all these images or most of them are female and most of them are white. And that could just be my browser history that's shaping that. Um, but it's also like, you know, it's marketing towards certain demographics, probably part of material culture. So material culture or physical objects. So you can study them. I, that's the reason I brought these hats. Um, kind of start off with, with this one. This is basically a hat. I was in Cuba years ago. Um, me and a friend took a trip down there. Uh, it was interesting in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of them is just a culture that doesn't have mass commodities. I mean, it's a, it's, uh, it's a different place in terms of economic development. And so this bought this hat there. Um, notice there's no, there's no logo. Um, it's made there. I mean, they're not importing these hats. So it's made someone, uh, it's, it's made there right there in Havana, probably, probably not in a factory. It's probably somebody just making it, um, a group of people making them, um, putting them together. So that's that hat. And then this guy bought this hat in Spain a few years ago. Um, and, you know, a little bit different material. Um, it has, it's actually being imported now. So it's coming from some Asian country. I can't tell you what Asian country it's coming from. Um, but again, no logo. There's no logo on it. Um, it's kind of a reflection of, of material culture kind of get into clothing and dress. And then we get finally about this one here at the Gorn hat shop up in Portland. And now you get even the material, you, you know, materials are a lot different. This one is much more rough uh, in terms of material. It's probably coming right from straw. Uh, this one's been kind of treated in different ways, super soft, it's pliable. Um, the quality, you know, the quality, uh, the amount of work going into for the materials a lot more. Here we now we have we have a logo, um, you know where it's made and all that kind of stuff. Just part of material culture, right? But you can study that and examine that stuff and kind of look at how those things are different across the world, and we can understand culture in a different way. So we have material culture, and then non-material culture. Non-material culture are values, beliefs, and practices, or things that are just non the the, the non-artifacts, the, the non-physical world. Um, so what we think about fairness, like what is fair, right? It is something that's culturally specific. Uh, we learn ideas about fair. Um, for us, if you got caught speeding, in the, if you got caught speeding, if you had two different people were going 70 miles an hour between uh, Bend and Madras and Madras and Bend, and they were going 75 miles an hour, uh, they got pulled over by law enforcement, both of them get charged the same, we view that as being fair. Finland and now Britain and other European countries are moving to a fine system that's based on an income bracket. So that the, and there's different countries do different things, excuse me, do different things um, in terms of putting the limit and what and on how high the fee can be. 
but it's based on your income bracket. Um, so that somebody who made, you know, this amount of money versus this amount of money, this person's going to pay more in terms of their speeding pick ticket. So it's a graduated scale based on income. From a one perspective, if you're if the goal of a ticket is to deter speeding, probably makes more sense that it is a reflection of a percent of income. But that really goes strongly against our cultural viewpoint. I think that's why this sort of Fox News kind of response that when Obama started engaging in discussions about this, it kind of got be being labeled as being socialist, which is kind of interesting in itself of how that's being viewed as being um, socialist. I mean, the, again, you're swimming in water, right? What we see as being fair, we can get so strongly can, can committed to that idea, to a particular idea of fairness without recognizing that those ideas of fairness are actually um, learned, that they're not natural, they're not unnatural, but they're just part of being a learned process. Makes me think about too, you know, this is, this probably actually belongs up into non-material, or into material culture. I was traveling in Idaho years ago. Um, my son and I pulled into a Fred Meyer late at night and I was waiting at the gas pump, waiting, waiting, waiting. It's like, there's a, there was somebody who's cleaning the, cleaning the stalls. And I was like, okay, when are they gonna start pumping the gas? And then it dawned on me a while later, like, oh, we're not in Oregon anymore. Um, I guess this is non-material culture. It's like the practices within a culture itself. And so, yeah, even anyway, I was just like, whoa, well, I guess I, can get, I need to get out of my car and pump my gas. Um, folkways, the folkways of a particular culture are greetings, greetings for one another. So folkways are just kind of practices uh, within a culture. So greetings are interesting around the world we could look at. Uh, we'll kind of talk about this idea of rugged individualism. It'll come up throughout the class um, that we have a strong, one of, the, one of the unique aspects of American life is that we have a strong cultural value on rugged individualism. Uh, this idea of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps when there's a lot of critique of that, um, of that idea, but it's a really strong cultural value that's rooted in our history of movement West, the frontier culture, the individual autonomy. It's captured in, our, in, in, in films and cinema and Hollywood, Westerns, John Wayne, if you know John Wayne, at a, a, a cowboy Western figure from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Um, this sort of very, you know, stu very uh, independent, frontier, rugged, individualistic perspective, deeply rooted in American culture. Um, and there's a lot of sort of analysis that that rugged individualism, it shapes the way that we view the world for sure. Um, and sometimes there can be a, it can, it can be far from or a greater distance from the actual reality of the world. So looking at something like inequality from that rugged individualistic perspective, uh, we view it as a matter of motivation, dedication, that people can be self, they can, they can, they can move themselves to any, any position for the most part. Um, and it, it gets in the way of really more accurately understanding that sort of that self-determination complex interaction between the individual and society itself. Maybe we'll talk about this in class a little bit, but think about status. Status is your social position. And we mark social position based on a lot of different things. One of them is maybe the coffee that we drink. Um, and so you can, I was going to have everyone just sort of rank these items. So we will do that in class. All right, let's kind of go into theme number two, ideal culture versus practice culture. Um, conceptually, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, I think a lot of this stuff, this is true in a lot of disciplines, the concepts may be pretty straightforward, but it's where you see them and how you see them and um, the value and importance of seeing these kind of things. So ideal culture is what we want it to be. Right? So it's like what we want culture to be, the ideal form, what we strive to be our aspirational culture. And then you have the reality of the practice culture. So we have an ideal of equal opportunity, right? And we have, that's our ideal. And then we have the practice world itself. Like, you know, well, how close are we to, to achieving that? What is the reality of that? Uh, we have more discussions today about equity, right? About equity. So there's a difference between equality and equity. Equality would be like, okay, well, this is equality. Everybody has the same box, but it's not equitable because this person actually needs more boxes to be able to see the game. And then it's like, well, let's just remove the fence so that everyone can see. It becomes like a universal design kind of feature. So 
Um, we look at, you know, our ideal culture versus practice culture here. We look at the, 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 the stratification, degrees of stratification, the top 90% versus the, the, the first 10%. And you just look, you become more stratified. And that may be far from what our ideal culture is. In fact, there's, I'm not sure if I'll show this chart later on and stratification, we'll get to stratification, but Americans' perception of reality of stratification uh, compared to other industrialized countries is further off. Let me restate that. So Americans tend to perceive that there's less inequality than there actually is. Um, and the degree to we that we do that is far less than in most other developed um, countries where they have a more accurate perception of class um, inequality and more accurate, more a different reflection on what's causing that. Americans tend to see it about hard work and dedication and those things. We have a cultural, our ideal culture is that, you know, voting is a constitutional right, that it's an important part of being a member of the community. It's about civic engagement. Um, but we have issues going on, the practice culture. I mean, it's political, both uh, Republicans and Democrats are involved in processes in terms of shaping um, the access to voting and sort of voting process. Think about things like family values. We have we, you know, a culture that, um, this is more true in the past when, you know, 1980s, 90s, there's a lot of discussions from politicians, conservative politicians talking about family values. It was a, like a, a big central theme among the Republican party. Um, but the reality is, too, that, you know, we, we have this ideal culture of family values, and at the same time, we have a lot of things that are going on in the ideal culture that kind of question to what extent are we really committed to this value of family values. We're the only industrialized country that does not have paid um, maternity leave or access to paternity leave. Um, a person, through their employer, has to go on short-term disability, so it's a you know, for uh, to receive family medical leave. It's part of the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, so it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, if we really were supportive in terms of family values, it seems like that would be one part in terms of policy. Um, even like our minimum wage, uh, minimum wage law, you know, it's like our ideal culture versus our practice culture. You know, people are working, they're working full time, 40 hours a week, but yet, you know, it's going to be difficult to, you um, to raise a family, to participate fully in American society and culture based on those um, wages. I think I kind of like ideal culture in terms of representation, we can kind of go there, right? This sort of what we get, what gets shown to us being our, not the ideal body, the ideal female body, the ideal male body, both of these are, <laughs> you know, bodies, you know, you have the bodies and then you have the, the reality. Um, you know, like, you know, and, you know, it's like this sort of ideal versus practice culture. So what does it distinguish the two tell us? I think one is like, well, what, how far is the distance between the ideal and the practice? Um, how aware are we of the difference between the two? Um, and I think it's important if we can distinguish between the ideal and the practice culture, we're in a better position to, to say, whoa, to, to, to say, I <laughs> say, well, we're in a better position to navigate that and to alter that. And we have an aspirational goal, like this is who we, we claim to be, want to be, these are the values that we proclaim, you know, and that's kind of, we can work closer to making, making that happen. Um, it also informs us a, a lot about the unique part of a culture, about what, what is that culture, um, you know, what are the stories that, that culture tells, um, how do those ideas of ideal and practice culture get developed? I like this book, Fantasy Land, which is an interesting read, Kurt Anderson, um, who really kind of explores Americans' abil inability to engage with reality um, or more the ideal culture itself or the practice culture itself. And Americans tend to live in fantasy land. And he traces this back to from, from the establishment of the colonies all the way to contemporary society, even like the development of Hollywood like all these different kinds of things. We, America has been built on this sort of this ideal and this ideal of, of um, certain kinds of freedoms and autonomy and a classless structure. And we have this sort of ideal, but the reality is, uh, is different from that. 
So if we can, understanding that helps us understand culture better as well. And I think I need to say too, is that not, not no culture, does their ideal culture and practice culture, do they align? It's kind of like, you know, the, the stories that we tell, um, you know, we have, um, yeah, we have aspirations and goals. Um, and so they're never going to be aligned for any culture, but it's kind of a, you can study the stories that cultures tell. You can look at the difference, the degree of difference between the two. And the more that we're aware of that difference, we can be in a better position to actually kind of change and move that. Okay, theme number three is just kind of a shorter one is the movement of culture. So culture spreads. Um, I mentioned before, perhaps that if you look at the American the population in the United States today, between, I don't know, let's just say 380 million people in the United States today, that was the world population in the mid 1500s. So you take everyone in the United States today, place them throughout the world. Um, you go back to the mid 1500s, that was the world population in the 1500s. And then you kind of then we, let's then you kind of go start going into okay new technologies movement of people movement of goods things accelerate in different time periods faster than others and then you get the movement when people are moving they're moving artifacts they're bringing things with them right they're bringing items they're bringing culture they're bringing practices they're bringing values so things move so we have different concepts and different ways of thinking about that movement so one of them is just cultural diffusion and. Cultural diffusion is when, yeah, basically people are moving, migrating or immigrating, and the culture that they're bringing is getting diffused into the culture that they're going to. So it's kind of like that more neutral term. Um, African-Americans, the Great Migration, 1950, uh, 1915, um, pre-World like World War I, World War II, um, you know, this migration out of the South for a lot of different reasons. Part of it was economic, part of it was leaving the oppressive order of the South, uh, the promise of more um, egalitarian ways of life, or at least more, more freedom, um, uh, less racism, although, you know, there's some complications with that. But this movement out of the, out of the South, the Great Migration, and where did, where did African Americans go? They, wherever they went, they brought their culture. So the blues, there's like the St. Louis blues, Kansas City blues, Chicago blues. And these were like epicenters. Uh, you know, music is a, I mean, I, music is a cool thing, uh, a great art form. And you can follow the story of the blues. You study the blues, you really get the story of history and culture and the movement of people and cultural diffusion. Food, uh, you can kind of go down that pathway um, as well. Then there's cultural um, leveling, which is, um, a little bit different concept. I'll be back in a second. All right, I'm back. I had to get a little bit more coffee going on. Um, yeah, okay. So the second concept is this idea of cultural leveling. And you can think about it as like things become more alike. Or, and usually it's a process where developing country or developed countries spread their culture um, to another country, and then that happens around the world and things get leveled, things get more of the same, more homogenous, more similar. So for example, McDonald's around the world, Starbucks around the world, uh, institutions like that around the world. So you go, go uh, to Western Europe, go to South America, and you find you know, a lot of you know, American corpor corporations or Western European corporations um, you know, that are in those, in those places and in those cultures, or not only the corporations and the businesses, but maybe practices as well, media, these kind of things. So cultural leveling. So that's kind of that process. So there's diffusion, which kind of deals with just like the movement of things. Leveling, now things become this idea that things are becoming more homogenous, more similar across the world where you can go um, that was what, you know, you can go to, to uh, remember our first travel to Spain and going to a hard rock cafe. I just thought that was kind of really odd uh, to have right down in downtown Madrid. Um, I mean, I thought it was odd at that time. I, think, I guess I can see that sort of that, that those institutions are, are moved throughout the world. Um, things get leveled in that regard. Um, that's why really one of the refreshing parts of being in Cuba is just so different in that regard. There was no cultural leveling because of the um, because of the policies of the Cuban government 
and, and the United States uh, in terms of the uh, economic embargo, um, the inability to trade and movement of goods. So there was no leveling going on. Um, if there was leveling, it would have been coming from, from Russia or from China um, and not the United States. So anyway, really kind of this different concept. And then you have imperialism, cultural, um, cultural imperialism, I should put the other word here. So it's imperialism, it's cultural imperialism. So it puts a different lens on it. So you have diffusion, it's just the movement of people bringing their culture and values and things like that and their practices. We have leveling, things become more the same. And then we have cultural imperialism. So it's domination, where culture is moving and it's dominating that other culture. So for example, it's like this becomes an image of that, that the, not only the institutions, but values that are embedded in them, like mass, like the consuming, the consumer-oriented society, individualism that's wrapped up in terms of our uh, all these different goods. I mean, think about all that shampoo, right? And all those different ways of marketing for kids, for adults, for men, for women. You know, it's very individual, very narrowing of the human experience in that regard. That's all this stuff moving from the developed countries to middle and lower income countries. And that's imperializing, it's taking over, it's colonizing a culture um, is what that term is kind of trying, is signifying. Um, and for sure, you know, like, you know, Starbucks goes to a different country. Um, it kind of meets up with that culture a little bit too. Um, so it's not like the same store, the same, all the same products were delivered in the same way. So there may be some reflection of local culture going on. Um, and at the same time, it's a sort of moving dominant cultural values from dominant countries into these other developing countries. Um, and you think about not just products are moving, but ideas are moving, cinema, the arts, and then uh, embedded, embedded underneath all that stuff is, I, you know, values that are underlying mass consumption, marketing, all these different kinds of aspects are part of that. I mean, you could look at it in parts. I mean, some look at that as it's about trying to spread economic development. Um, you can also look at it from this sort of vantage point of, of what's happening to local culture um, itself, of transforming, and maybe there's some pluses and minuses with that. And maybe it's where you stand on the social order within that as well. So last concept about that is cultural imperialism relates to hegemony, which is this idea of domination by consent. Um, actually, let's kind of bypass this. We'll kind of come back to this later on in the term. Uh, the fourth theme to kind of go after is, uh, this. Some, let's get into interactionism, the symbolic world, looking at language, symbols, and meaning. The superior wharf hypothesis is this idea that language influences our thought. Um, it used to be linguistic determinism where Edwin Sapir, Benjamin Whorf, they believe this idea that language determines rea your reality so that you view the world through a lens of language. Uh, you have certain words to describe reality embedded in those words are values and that's how you view the world itself. So the language influences how we think. If it influences how we think, it influences how we respond to the world itself. Um, language, is constrains us, shapes us. Um, language defines things, you know, categories, you know, it's like this becomes something that shapes the human experience. Language comes out of culture. So you go to like our cultural values, our values are gonna be embedded in our language. Um, and the question to raise is, well, to what extent is this really true? And scientists and researchers have been trying to, you know, have, tested this hypothesis and theories over, over a course of time. There's still a lot of debate to what the extent to which language is determining um, reality. And there's, you know, two different books, kind of two different perspectives when thinking about language. Uh, I find language and symbols, the symbolic world, fascinating because it's a way to access culture and understand, better understanding different cultures. And it's also, it's the degree of influence. So those who, you know, researchers who question or critique this idea that language determines reality, I think it's a fair critique. I mean, language may not determine, but the question is to what degree does it shape reality? To what degree is language a reflection of cultural values and ideals? Um, 
I can give you an example of this term, you know, the, 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 the noun disaster. Kind of interesting, you go back to, you know, this French disastre, uh, Italian disastro, ill star dis, pejorative, ill, and then star planet uh, first, you know, first for um, from astrum for star. It's like, ah, man, just when I found that, when I discovered that, or somebody told me that, it's like, oh, that's really interesting, like that word disaster. Now all of a sudden I have a new way of thinking about disaster, um, the breaking down, the etymology, the origins of that, that word itself. But I'll give you a couple of different examples. I may not have been the, the best example, um, but I'll give you some, you know, I'll give you another one and then we'll, in class we'll talk about more. Um, in graduate school, when I was in my social work program, uh, had a fellow appear in class and she didn't talk a lot throughout the course of the term and near the end of the, of course, the whole program and near the end of the program, one student in the class or one peer, you know, asked her, so why are you so shy? Um, and she said in a way, it really didn't seem like a negative thing, but I mean, the word shy implies some sort of deficit. And the, the, the person responded, she said, it's not that I'm shy, it's that I'm not afraid to be quiet. And that was like really profound to me. And I, you know, I was like, wow, what a difference in describing the world, right? And we view the world through the lens of language. So if you see that person, to see an individual or an individual sees themselves as being shy, totally a different place than not afraid to be quiet. And I was just like blown away as I almost fell out of my chair when she said that. Um, yeah, so it kind of leads us and we'll get, go through more examples in class. I mean, basically get into all kinds of fun language stuff. If you look at the history of cuss words, Net, Netflix was doing a series on, on uh, cuss words uh, and language. Super fun, like words that we find offensive in our country may be different in another country. What are the etymology of those words? What do they actually mean? Where do they come from? Uh, you know, as if culture is a story to tell, like the artifacts, language is a story to tell. Like where does that, that language come from? What does it mean? Um, and then how does language shape reality? Then we can kind of get into this idea of social construction of reality. This will become important. We talk about social construction of gender, social construction of race, that constructs that we have, so constructs, categories that we have are not determined by the actual physical world itself, but it's humans that have created these and then overlaid them onto the physical world. So they're constructs. And that we view the world through these constructs. Constructs that are more stable are more universally shared in a particular uh, culture or a particular society. Uh, there's this agreed upon meaning at some point it may be to the point where it's so institutionalized that people view it as reality. They take it for granted and they don't see the arbitrary nature of it. Um, part of the social construction of reality and we're constructing reality is, um, you know, language involved in that. Like how, the language that we use to describe reality itself is part of that constructing reality. Meaning that the meaning that we give things is very arbitrary. Uh, to sometimes less, more than less than others, but it's arbitrary, but yet it's very real. To go back to an example from, from last week in marijuana, going back to marijuana in the 1930s and then 1940s, 1950s, the big marijuana scare, the marijuana menace, uh, Reefer Madness, the film that came out, the first institution, federal institution to, to address uh, any drug, well, opium before that, but to address marijuana in 1937, the Marijuana Stamp Tax Act, uh, we, we have the development of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1937, and this is all about the social construction of the meaning of marijuana and how that changed. So, so, social construction of alcohol is another interesting one. Colonial America, I mean, probably drinking beer was much safer than drinking water, uh, just sort of the sanitation issues that were going on. Maybe not colonial America, but when you get into, starting to get into cities and, and colonies getting larger, health issues become more of a problem. Uh, the idea that alcoholism is a disease uh, starts to emerge in the 19, I believe that was probably 1930s, 1940s, like this disease medical model concept. Then we move to like the ideas about alcohol dependence, you know, like even that changing in language, different constructed realities and how we're thinking about that particular um, social world. So you kind of hear some of the stuff about alcohol prohibition, right? So to get to prohibition, uh, to actually, you know, to criminalize, to, to criminalize 
um, alcohol consumption, possession and consumption, you have to get be at a place, you have to construct a particular reality about it so that alcohol caused crime, alcohol caused moral degradation, alcohol, you know, did these things, therefore we have to control it. So that's about, well, then you got to ask the question, well, who's constructing that reality and why are they constructing that reality in that particular way? So who's constructing it? And then this kind of gets maybe the hegemony we'll get back to later, but it's like you have maybe some claims makers are constructing it, but the general population is agreeing to it. So hegemony is this part where it's the community, people are agreeing to something that even may be against their own self interest. Marijuana, we could do the sort of same thing as well. Uh, marijuana is the most violence causing drug in the history of mankind. Henry Enslinger was the, the head of the, head, uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, all these campaigns that are kind of really interesting. You could kind of YouTube search, find all these you know, historical uh, videos about you know, with him talking uh, at these public events, scaring up, scaring people about, about this thing of marijuana and notice it's spelled with the apes. There's a connection to Mexico that's going on, while they're going on as well. There's sort of a race connection that's happening um, in terms of the marijuana men menace. Uh, here's uh, Anslinger, um, just some different quotes, satanic music, jazz, swing, outlaw marijuana is the de degenerate race on the degenerate races. Addictive drug produces users insanity, criminality and death. Um, it makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Marijuana leads to pacifism, communist brainwashing. I mean, it's comical from today's perspective, but during that time period, man, that's what people are believing in. Um, they've constructed that reality and it's forgot the arbitrary nature of it. Then you fast forward 1980s, the crack scare of the 1980s, way before your, for a lot of you, for most of you, your time, that's sort of another kind of, you know, drug scare that happened, Nancy Reagan here, Just Say No campaign, uh, this idea about crack babies, largely a constructed, uh, rea a constructed reality, it had something to do, there's political factors, there's fears, there's things that are going on. The consequence of that stuff is the war on drugs in the 1980s that led to mass incarceration. We incarcerate per, per capita by far more than anyone, anyone else in the world. Uh, we have the highest incarceration rate and, and that, really is a byproduct to a large extent of the war on drugs in the 1980s. Just different sentencing for different substances, crack, cocaine, inner city, powder cocaine, uh, middle class, upper middle class whites, different sentences, um, these different, so race and class became part of this discussion as well. Let me kind of get into like meth in the 1990s, opioid more, more, more recent crisis, um, even the way that we construct those different realities. Um, there's, there's, there's these kind of campaigns don't do a good job of informing the public. They do a good job of sensationalizing and stirring up fear versus providing information. Um, opioid crisis, you know, different kind of response. Um, yeah, so anyway, just kind of walking through and we think about social construction is gets us into the meaning that we assign and how we assign meaning. Notice here that if you just kind of look at, you know, if we're looking at dangerous substances, uh, we do have some discussion about alcohol and the dangerousness of alcohol, but usually we focus on, um, we demonize other things much more so than, than alcohol itself. Uh, interesting next video about fonts. It's kind of interesting. So you go, let's go social construction of reality, kind of let's go back here. Okay, we're, we're in the symbolic world, right? Language meaning, how we assign meaning to things. And then, you know, we social construction, social construction of reality. And then we get into font. Even when we see certain font, now we make associations like, oh, I know that font is associated with, with something. And even font, we're having interpretations. What is that font? And what emotional state? You got to be, I've got to be thinking that there are those who are working in marketing and advertising, do focus group studies and sort of like font and what kind of emotional responses people have to, to font. Um, and there's sort of this overlay in terms of mass marketing and corporate, corporate world and fonts. And we can make these kind of connections about color, like, like color, like I, this right here is Wilson. It's like, how, oh, of course that's Facebook, Pepsi, um, Google, Suzuki, Amazon, Hilton. It's like, well, it's pretty like, I mean, that's complex. Like we're learning this system of signs, right? Monster, uh, Skype. We learn all these different kinds of things 
uh, that becomes the, the cultural part of the cultural language. And it's the meaning that we assign to all these different fonts. Um, looking at, at self-grooming, shaving ones for females, shaving their arms and shaving their legs. This is a great short video, uh, a prickly subject. You can just put that in the search engine. It's basically this four, I think it's four or five minutes, her talking about not shaving, not shaving and the beauty of her body and recognizing the beauty of her body. Janu, Janu, Janu Harry, uh, sort of a, a social little movement, but it's within the culture, like for women to not shave, take the month off, uh, don't shave. To go back to social construction of reality, social construction of body hair, social construction of body hair on males and females. Um, you know, a lot of cultural things that are going on there. Products, we have products, artifacts, material culture. So you go down, go down, go down next time you're in the grocery store, go down, the, look at all the different uh, razors that there are. Razors for women, razors for men, they're razors, right? I bet it's this marketing and development, pink uh, versus blues. Um, you know, it, it happens in our products in so many different ways. But women had to, you know, had to encourage women that having body hair was an embarrassment. It was a, it was not a good thing, right? That's a lot of marketing developments, culture stuff going on um, within that. Okay. And then finally is uh, looking at some very specific theories of the self and we'll play with these or we'll talk about them in more detail in class. Um, but basically now we're kind of get into much more the micro level, the individual, the individual identity, how we think about individual identity and development. If you're in developmental psych, you're in social psych, you get some of these different theories, sociology, we kind of get into them as well. And um we kind of just, we get into them and we talk about them maybe a little bit differently than you would in, in psychology. So basically you have the self. So it's meaning, language, thought that's coming from culture. It's coming through socialization. Um, you know, those who are, that we are around that we are learning from. So socialization is the process of learning culture. And there's different theories about the self. <clears throat> So you have the Mead, we'll start off in the far left there. You have Mead, which makes, Mead believes, he's a behaviorist, believes that all behavior is learned. And it's learned by taking the perspective of other. So we take the perspective of other. Sometimes we take the perspective of a specific other. So I take the perspective of when your early years of your mother, your father, family members, uh, teacher, uh, friend, you take the perspective of other and you imagine how they view you. And this is part of the way in which we develop a sense of who we are. And then Mead walks through, you have the I, which is the unsocialized self or a self that doesn't, that's not thinking about how other individuals see them. So it's the individuals, the I is the self without um, impact from a perception of how other people might see them. And then there's the me, which is the reflective self. If I do this, or this is how an individual sees me, I'm thinking before I act, this is the behaviorism part. I think before I act, I'm taking the position of other to think how they might see me. And that's shaping uh, my identity, my behavior and who I am. And that's kind of basically the kind of concept. And then he walks through these different stages of development all the way from, and it's based on our developmental, um, you know, just sort of our age, our development, you know, where we're at developmentally. And then all the way to the game stage when we become an adolescence where we can take not only the role of a specific other, but the generalized other, the understanding of society itself or larger social groups. So wondering, oh, this is what society expects of me. That becomes a little bit later on. You know, when kids are really young, they don't know that, right? They don't have a, they, they don't have a concept of a generalized other. This is when kids can do kind of funny things because they don't know the rules of society yet. Um, then you have Cooley. Moving on to another theory, Cooley has a sort of idea of the looking glass self. So we imagine how others look, how we look to others. So I'm thinking there's different stages to that. I imagine how somebody sees me. I'm wondering about my, their interpretation of me. How do I think that they see me? This all becomes part of a process of the looking glass self. If you've ever seen the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks, at some point in the movie, he has, gets a friend and his friend becomes the, the, the volleyball. And it's Wilson, right? And he, then he, with, um, I believe it's with blood that he makes a face, puts it on Wilson, that becomes his friend. It becomes his looking glass self. Um, and that looking glass self is really powerful. It, we, there's a lot of evidence and research that people who are in solitary confinement, people who are, have been um, without human contact, that their self starts to break down. 
um, and that we being immersed either socially with others or in a culture where we see things in terms of media, these become part of our looking glass self. And then um, let's not talk about Don, like Thomas. The Thomas theorem is if you define it's real, it's real and its consequences, it gets us into a, the definitions of reality. How we define reality influences how we respond to it. So the third one really to kind of get after in terms of self-development is Goffman and Goffman is dramaturgy or impression management. So what Goffman sort of views is that uh, we are all like the Shakespearean idea. We're all actors on a stage. We're all engaged in, in performance. Gender is a performance. Um, we, we don't, we, we, we may embody gender, but gender is something that we do. Uh, for example, and so we're all, you know, it's theatrical performance. So this is a, you know, a patient is playing a role of patient. Nurse is playing a role of nurse. Uh, we play gender. We learn ideas about gender. It's looking glass self, what we see ourselves versus what, what, what we actually are. Where does that come from? These are like, you know, society, culture kind of things that are going on um, that we can see. We can kind of go, you know, when, um, you know, playing roles, the roles that we play. Uh, this is becomes like the me taking the role of other. This is part of an important part of self-development for me it is like the role playing and role acting is because we're stepping into scripts. We're stepping into ideas. Cooley, um, the idea of the looking glass self. I am not what I think I am. I am not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So think about all the interpretive levels of that, of that thing. It's a lot of perceptual things that are going on. And the tricky part is sometimes our perceptions may not be accurate. So sometimes we project and think that some people may see us in a particular way, but it may not be accurate, but that still impacts our own self-concept and who we think we are. Um, and then we kind of get into race and body and age and all different kinds of things like that. That can kind of gets into the self-development. That's that self-determination, right? Individual within society itself. So individual and um, and structure and society and that interplay between the two. Something like straight white teeth. Something like our body, um, our our body size, uh, our gender, race. All these different kind of things start to start to play a factor in terms of self-development. Um, there's a cultural, cultural realities that we face in terms of all these different things. And we all navigate that space maybe in different ways. We can apply dramaturgy into different things, you know, like here's following a script, dra oops, following a script in terms of dramaturgy. Um, whoa, have you ever been to, every, nope. If you've ever been to, you ever been to Jamba, Jamba Juice, this is kind of like the McDonaldization um of workers in a way it's like they're handed a script here's a script to follow um you go to the doctor's office there's to go with dramaturgy again you go to the doctor's office the whole the office itself is a theater it's the it's the stage right and there's certain things that we expect as an audience member in going into a doctor's office where certain things we expect from the from the from the medical personnel, from the nurses, from the doctor, uh, from the PA, whoever we are, whoever we see, there's certain ways that we behave in the doctor, in the in the medical office as well. Um, so there's like these expectations, you know, that we're engaged in performance. Say so even this person here is engaged in a theatrical performance, um, dress, appearance, demeanor, it's part of that sort of persona. Um, it's also, you know, there's, you know, need would ask the questions that everything's learned behavior. Um, so what has shaped that learning process, uh, ideas about the first date. This is kind of a cute little fun little thing about the first date. Um, a lot of displays in terms of displays of masculinity, uh, a lot of dramaturgical elements going on, um, within that. And then you can watch this if you want. It's kind of interesting just looking at solitary confinement and the impact of solitary confinement. This is a, an episode that. 60 Minutes did years ago. Uh, this was a Ukrainian girl who was abandoned by her grandparents. The only living creature on the, on the farm, uh, there may have been other ones, but a dog. And so she started to imitate the dog um, and she became very dog-like. This is her, you know, carrying food. They videotaped her. So feral children, children who raise, uh, are raised in the wild sort of idea. And 
even as an adult, if we're not around other individuals, it has an impact on in terms of us. I mean, we need to be around others to develop a sense of self to greater or less degrees. I mean, it's not like a universal kind of things. But, you know, just like some stuff you want to read about it, just for about solitary confinement, the research is that it has a detrimental impact in terms of, of mental states and that it's uh, inhumane punishment. And then we're going to end up in class, we'll talk a little bit about nature and nurture, uh, why fundamentally placing things all in nature is problematic, putting it all in nurture is problematic. Um, as a culture, we kind of tend to see maybe value the nature argument more that males are just that way because of, or certain people that way because of, and we put in this sort of net, you know, biological determinism, this sort of nature sort of viewpoint. The reality is that self-determination, you know, and that's part biology, part social, part cultural, all those things that kind of make an impact. And there's an important in recognizing the flaws of that biological determinism, uh, the flaws in that sort of nature argument, because it leads us to some pretty scary places and it's not founded on um, strong evidence and research to support those ideas. All right, you guys are amazing and beautiful. Uh, have a great day and uh, look forward to talking about this stuff in class. Yeah, I encourage you as you're kind of working through these, these, uh, these lectures, if, if you come up with additional examples, things you want to bring into class, examples, illustrations, please do so. Uh, it, it enriches the classroom environment. Um, it provides more good food for thought. If you have questions, bring them forward as well. Always appreciate that. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. Be well.